Have you ever felt like the odd one out? That you just didn't belong? Have you ever turned up somewhere wearing completely the wrong clothes? Or you were out of your depth? Or everyone seemed to know each other? Your face didn't fit? It's not a good feeling, is it? Well, at the moment, lots of people are concerned about people being excluded or discriminated against because of their race or ethnicity. And it seems like a problem that just will never go away. Maybe you've experienced exclusion or discrimination yourself or, or seen it firsthand. It's really horrible, isn't it? The church has the solution to that problem. Now, that is a huge claim because it might seem that the church is as bad as everybody else when it comes to gathering together people who look the same or sound the same or already agree with each other. And it seems like it may be an even bigger claim to make, given where we are in the Bible at the beginning of Joshua, who was about to enter into the land. Think about it. We've got God's people, the people of Israel, who've escaped one form of brutal racial discrimination there in Exodus in Egypt. Slavery. They were enslaved by the Pharaoh and they've been led out by Moses and now under Joshua they're about to take the land of Canaan and kick out or destroy all of the people groups who are already living there. The Girgashites, the Jebusites, the Hittites and the Hivites. But right at the start we see that God's kingdom is not quite what it first appears. It's not actually a racial nation based around birth. They're all, I know everyone's descended from Abraham, we've looked at that. In previous weeks but actually anyone can join anyone is welcome anyone can change sides and leave their family and join God's family God's people anyone can belong and you cannot get anyone less likely to be accepted into God's people than Rahab and we're going to meet her in Joshua chapter 2 so get a Bible get an actual Bible and we're going to read uh, bits of Joshua 2 together, uh, starting at Joshua 2 verse 1. So just to summarise that, Joshua is sending spies into the land just as he and Caleb did under Moses. Not quite sure why, given how it went last time and they all got cold feet. Where do these spies go? Who do they meet? They meet Rahab, who, what does she do? Let's say she helps men commit adultery. In the gospel, she would be deemed to be down there with the tax collectors and the sinners. She is a bad, bad person. Is there a place for her in God's holy people? Well, what does she do? Clearly, these spies are a bit hopeless and she covers for them. And when the king of Jericho sent men uh, to Rahab and tells her to bring out the spies that have obviously just gone in there, um, because someone must have spotted them go in. What does she say? Let's read together verses uh, four and five of chapter two. It goes like this. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, true, the two men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. She'd hidden spies and she lied about it. Now, the Bible doesn't commend lying, even for a good reason or noble cause. It's just telling us what she did, and we can get into that another time. But why does she do what she does? Let's read in verses, uh, let's read there in verse 9. So, uh, before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. Wow, that's quite something, isn't it? She believes God's promise. And her evidence is there in verses uh, 10 and 11. If you go and look down, God's people have crossed the Red Sea, which parted before them. And they've already had victories on their way to where they are on the east side of the River Jordan. And we'll look back at those uh, in the action replay uh, because they're, they're, they're kind of interesting. But one thing that Rahab realises is they have no hope before God's people, before the Israelites. So what does she do? What does Rahab do? She changes sides and asks God for grace. Verse 12, let's look at that together. What does she say? What does she ask them for? She says, now then, please swear to me by the Lord that 
As I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. It's interesting, isn't it? She's not even quite asking for herself. Maybe she thinks she's not worthy. But the amazing thing is that she discovers that there isn't just a place for her household, but for her. That's what she's going to find out in the coming chapters. Rahab, the woman with a bad reputation who causes men to sin, finds a place in the people of God. And here's the kicker. She doesn't just sneak in. She is given a place of honour. And we see that at the very start of the New Testament. It's incredible. Let's just look at that list. The beginning of Matthew's Gospel. Uh, you might want to turn to it because it's quite fun to look at. I know it's just a boring list of names and we just look at lists and we immediately glaze over. But that's because we don't know who the people are and what the lists mean. And we should probably just read a bit more closely. So let's look there at verses uh, 1 to 6. Look, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And that includes Joseph, as we've looked at in previous weeks. Go down to verse 5. Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. There is Rahab. Slap bang in the middle of that first third of that genealogy, which takes us from Abraham to David. Wow. So, thought for the day. If there's a place of honour for Rahab, there is a place for anyone. For anyone. There's a place for you. There's a place for your friends. There's a place for whoever wants to join God's family. They belong. You belong. And in a world that is completely divided in so many ways, it is only the church, it is only God's people that offers that solution because we are all one in Jesus Christ in this family and Jesus Christ is our head. So that's the thought for the day. Something to pray. Well we can praise Jesus for how he has brought us together into one family and so we're going to say a prayer, you're going to say a prayer based on Paul's letter to the Ephesians in chapter 3. Let's just savour those words as I read them and then say a prayer to yourself at the end. Paul writes this, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Why don't you turn some of those amazing things into a prayer for yourself? Take a moment. Amen. That was something to pray, something to say if somebody asks you about this afterwards. Rahab is related to Jesus. They are literally one family. Well, if you've had enough, that's cool. Thanks for watching and speak to you next time. But if you want to lean in a little bit, I've got a bit more in the action replay.
Okay, action replay. Look again in verse 10. Here we go. Joshua chapter 2. In your actual Bible, what is Rahab referring to? Um, so let's have a look. Chapter 2, verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. So she's afraid because in a way, the conquest of the land has already begun. And it, it feels like it hasn't though, because Joshua is standing on the brink. Remember, all this will be yours. But actually, two of the tribes of Israel have already taken land east of the Jordan. Now, if we look at the map, on the right, we see tribes of, of Reuben and Gad have taken that land. And we read about that conquest in Numbers chapter 21. And having won these battles, Reuben and Gad put in a bid for that land. So those two tribes said, OK, we'll have this land. And Moses was a bit surprised because that's not part of the land that's been promised. That's not part of Canaan. And it almost looks like Reuben and Gad tribes are playing it safe because they don't actually think that Canaan will be taken. They don't think that God can do it, maybe. Is that what they're thinking? But they promise that they will fight for the land for the Israelites. They promise that they won't just stay east of the Jordan. They'll go over the Jordan with everybody else and fight for the land, which is why in Joshua 1, if you remember, the officers are going around the Reubenites and Gadites saying, remember the deal. You said you would fight for the land. Now, I'm 44 and I have a degree in theology. And to be honest, I didn't really know that. So we're all learning. Anyway, that's probably enough for now. It would be brilliant if you could just read chapter two of Joshua. Now you understand roughly what's going on for yourself. Just take a moment to do that. You would find it eminently worthwhile. And if before the next one you could read all of Joshua's three and four, well, that would be brilliant and you'd already be up to speed. So uh, why don't you try and factor that in to do this week and then I'll see you next time.